Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. And that mission has led me to create the Become a Better Investor community, where you get access to the tools you need to create, grow, and protect your wealth. Go to MyWorstInvestmentEver.com right now to claim your spot. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest Sonia Kurana. Sonia, are you ready to join the mission? Totally am, Andrew, and that's a phenomenal mission that you have, and I can't even get started with <laughs> the kind of impact that you might be having on so many lives. Thank you for having me over, Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm <clears throat> I'm excited. I know it's uh, it's not been easy to get our time to match, so I'm really grateful that we have this time together. Let me introduce you to the audience. Sonia is the co-founder and CEO of the most creative and sought-after branded podcast company and a new age media venture, Wine Studio. While Sonia's career spans more than a decade across developing businesses and strategic roles, and a failed startup before navigating her way successfully through her second entrepreneurial stint, Wine Studio, what has conspired her success is owning her story and seeing through the many failures in her life as important milestones. TGIF, she often says, often, why? Because for her, it means, thank God I failed. <laughs> Tanya, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you're bringing to this wonderful world? I think, uh, you know, one thing that uh, really f I feel strongly about is empathy, uh, something that arises from a lot of compassion. And uh, a lot of people tell me, Andrew, that maybe, you know, as a leader, as a CXO, uh, that can make you a softie at heart. But I kind of uh, do not believe it that way. I do not see it that way. And uh, that as a value, as a belief system has been there with me ever since I've been a child. Uh, when I connect dots and I see that, you know, while I was a kid, the way I used to still go out of the way and help people in whatever capacity I could, uh, whether it is to thank my family for this upbringing um, or, uh, you know, just say that that's something that comes to me naturally is is for people to see but uh, that's definitely a unique proposition or a unique value that i bring to the world because i see everything from the lens of what the other person is going through whether it is a team member whether it is stakeholders whether it is friends family or anybody you know and uh, that helps me navigate my way through relationships and really build strong, long-lasting relationships where trust is of utmost value. Mm. And Sonia, I wonder if that, you know, one of the benefits of women leaders is the ability to have more empathy. And maybe men are like, get tough. Come on, get up. Let's go. No excuses. Let's do it. Come on. And we're always like that. And maybe the leadership qualities that you're talking about are, you know, valuable from a female perspective. Uh, yes. And, and, uh, you know, why I say this is because, uh, Andrew, I was in a conversation very recently with another phenomenal uh, leader as a CXO who happens to have built a unicorn in India. And she's just started another venture now. And she said that, you know, as a leader, we need to be in the times that we are in, we need to be ruthless and kind at the same time. So I really started thinking that, you know, while, uh, you know, we look at gender roles and we look at how different genders perform differently at workplaces and women have this tendency to nurture, have this tendency to come from a space of compassion, but at the same time, uh, being ruthless is also important because that's how businesses grow. You need to be focused, laser right focused on what the objective is. But at the same time, have the kindness to maybe let people fail, maybe allow that space for people to also grow by making those mistakes, mm. but not allowing for those mistakes time and again. So that's ruthless. That's being ruthless, but being kind as well. 
and that's the right balance that i think whatever gender we uh, belong to so that's uh, been a learning for me very recently yeah you know um as an american who lives in thailand now for 30 years of my life i really you you can't go around a thai business you know yelling and demanding the way you would probably in an american business and it's definitely taught me that uh you know guiding people supporting people and the way that i think about the ruthlessness is a ruthless focus on the needs of the customer i'm not getting tough on you just because i yeah. want to be tough i'm getting tough on you because we need to deliver better for the customer and that is a message that i think you know it's hard to argue that if you can do that right and not drop the ball for the customer whether you're mm -hmm. male female lower higher whatever level you are in the company the fact is is that you know that's really what it's about because if you can satisfy the customer then you know most of the other things take care of themselves um, i wonder if you could tell us a little bit about wine studio and what Absolutely. you're doing maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what you're doing with uh with wine studio sure uh, thank you for asking that andrew and uh, so we are we're definitely serving customers the best way we can and something that really started this spark within of starting something called as wine studio so wine stands for what's your narrative and uh, basically saying that you know everybody has a story every brand has a story and uh, it was before wine that i was working on something called as india network which was building community on ground for startups in tier two, tier three cities, helping them build an ecosystem. That's when I realized, so, you know, you know, for everybody who's listening, uh, India has two very different uh, parts to it. India has uh, a very metropolitan, cosmopolitan crowd, very urban, very aware, exposed to how the world behaves, what what is going on, what's trending, very in tune with everything across the globe and then there's an india which we call as bharat uh, where there are people who aspire to live the metropolitan life but they do not have the same wherewithal and resources that the metropolitan urban millennial cosmopolitan cosmopolitan crowd um, has uh, yet they have that aspiration because internet penetration has grown so much they see that they consume the same content uh, that is the community, that is the community which is now also ambitious, which is now also innovative and creating their own startups and ventures. But for the lack of that exposure, they do not know how to tell their story. They do not know how to really put their narrative out to the world. And they have some brilliant, bizarre, phenomenal innovations, <laughs> but it's sad that they're not able to take it out to the world. And uh, while doing all of this is where I realized that, you know, there is space for me to work on content and helping these startups really focus on bringing out their stories. So that's what I out. And then I ended up having this conversation on the last day of that retreat that why don't we look at doing something together? That's where uh, this was 2019 of June. And uh, in September 2019 is when we started this business, this venture called Vine Studio, with the intention of helping businesses leverage the power of audio and podcasts to bring out their narratives. And we started working with startups, uh, brands, a lot of entrepreneurs, solopreneurs. And that kind of started also showing us results because this content that we started creating for these uh, businesses, small brands, also started showing the kind of deep engagement that was happening through podcasts and through audio content. And more of them wanted to start creating these because they saw that while uh, while that does not give them the kind of vast uh, audience that a YouTube or a TikTok does, but it gives them depth. It gives them longer engagement. Uh, so that's how it happened. And now we've been working with a lot of big brands as well. So uh, am I still catering to startups in tier two, tier three only? No, we are also catering to a lot of big businesses and big brands. Um, and that is what has kind of also given us the confidence that the space that we are in, we've got our own proof of concept. We've already got in 
enough business we are already making good revenue so that kind of as a startup is a great validation of where you are and where you are headed and uh, and that's been an interesting ride from just me and my co-founder to now a team of 15 i don't think i could have asked for anything better mm-hmm. than, than where we are right now and it's only going to get better fantastic well that's exciting and yeah there's so much going on in india it's just incredible the diversity of ideas and all of that so it's exciting that you're bringing that out well now it's time to share your worst investment ever and since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story you know while i would love to talk about uh, my worst monetary investments but i think everybody makes those and learns and gets up from there but since i am in the business of narratives and storytelling people owning up their narratives was that as a kid who was a 10 year old girl in school i uh, failed you know that's that's where the tgif comes from thank god i failed because now i look back and i realize that failure was good but back then i was horrible at mathematics and horrible is an understatement um and i hope that the audience who listens to this also resonates that we are not great at everything we figure out what our strengths are eventually but back then of course you know you're bad at one subject your peers your colleagues uh, your parents your family always tries to tell you that you know this is your weakness invest on it more so that you can get better at it mm. um but that's a bad strategy please do not invest in things that you're bad at uh and i try to really invest into that okay i got better but was it something that i was always interested in uh, getting better at it, at it did it really help me uh, feel better or feel confident no because nobody ever amplified or helped me look at what my strength was my strength always was english my strength always was stories my strength was history i loved stories i loved the world of narratives and things that used to take me to a different world and nobody helped me ever realize that this is where i need to invest more this is where i need to spend more time on and uh, what did it eventually where did it eventually, for the entire duration of my school which in india is the final year of your school i felt like i'm not good enough i felt terrible i did not enjoy my school days i just felt that this time needs to end soonest um and you know that time i still remember andrew when i failed in 6th grade i actually contemplated suicide because i felt that my life is not worth it nobody will understand me i am a failure instead of looking at it as an event in my life i ended up looking at it as a noun and uh, used that as a tag up until my first venture which was in 2016 and whatever used to happen before that you know whether it was getting the best placement in college whether it was getting a good rank to get through the university that i wanted to get through i always felt andrew that this was happening by default it has not been designed by me you know that is where you end up leading yourself to when you do not invest into your strength when you do not have the support system that helps you see what your strength is mm. and um it was only in 20 uh, it was only after 2016 when i met the the right people in my life. i started looking at was, there was always this fear that i had kind of started living with that i'm not good enough that, that i do not belong where i am at and uh, the that my parents uh, did not help me look into my strengths and were always pushing me in my uh, on focusing on my weaknesses um maybe they do not even love me they do not understand me so there were these three consistent fears that played into my life up until the time that i met the right mentors and i saw the story that i was actually living with the story that i'd created out of 
the fact was that i had failed that mm. i was not good at maths that was the fact but the story that i had created was i'm not good enough mm. um i do not belong here i'm not worthy enough so all those never enough moments kind of became big mountain then of course uh, you know that's moment of reflection that comes in and you see that okay you know uh, maybe you shouldn't own them or own your narrative now i openly own it with elan that you know this is how it is this is who i am and i wasn't good at that so be it so now is the time that i've been investing on my strength on what i'm good at and uh, that's been the transition from having invested into the worst thing in my life to now knowing what to invest into mm. so how would you summarize the lessons that you learn well i think one thing that i would say is that uh, own your narrative uh, people will tell you a lot of things but it is important for everyone to really look into their life and uh, see and understand what is this really telling me and uh, is this telling me that uh, whatever you're investing into you know just look at it uh, from a very outside perspective you know step out of your own situation and take a helicopter view that okay you know this is happening but what is the story that i'm creating out of it what is this really telling me is this about me or is this about the situation so making it more objective and uh, taking the emotion out of it helps you see things more rationally and clearly and clarity as they say is power so i think that has been the biggest takeaway mm -hmm. so bring clarity and that is where the power lies and invest into your strengths that is the second lesson and third uh, take emotion out of situations that drain you look at it more rationally um lots of great things there maybe i'll summarize a few things that i take away um well the first thing i like the idea of stepping stepping outside of yourself and one of the exercises i've done is the idea of kind of imagining that you're up on the ceiling of the room looking down and then yeah. use that as a tool to observe yourself. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I also realized that I needed outside help. Like you mentioned, mm. you know, you weren't getting it. I remember part of my narrative when I was young was that I was just a skinny kid and, you know, I was afraid, I was intimidated easily. And I was in a group therapy session when I was 17 and the counselor told me, stand up, go over to the mirror. He said, you're almost six foot tall. You know, you're a big guy, you know, you're not a small guy. And I was like, I didn't even really think of that, you know, and yeah. he tried to kind of help me break my narrative. And I think that's the other thing that I take away is that you can change your narrative. So when yeah. it does get depressing and, and it does feel down uh, and you do feel frustrated, well, it's probably because you're living someone else's what yeah. someone else thinks you should be doing. But ultimately, I think as we get older, we realize that what's our number one job to be a better me, to be a better yeah. you. And so I think yeah. you, you remind us of that. And, and I think that's a, a great, great lesson. Anything you would add to that? I think uh, you've very beautifully summed that up. Um, and, uh, you know, something that you said that you're looking at it, you know, look at it from the perspective of you being on the ceiling and, uh, and that that also reminds me that you know think about it that if you were a fly in your own life and you were sitting on the wall and uh, looking into your life how would you see it so that's another you know the flies eye view is mm. is how i love to say it but yes i think you've beautifully summarized it and at the end of the day um you know there's this beautiful quotation that i read in this book by brenny brown that uh, you know it's you who's in the arena right um and you only know what's going on. So don't let anybody else belittle you. Don't let anybody else tell you what to do, who you are, where you come from. Since you are the one who's taking that sweat, that grind. So get up and decide. But don't let anybody else decide who you are. And don't let anybody tell you what's your narrative. 
So that's that's how I would be able to explain it because I don't really exactly remember the quotation, mm. but uh, yeah, that's what it means for me. Yeah. So let's go back in time and think about, you know, when this was all going on. And now, you know, the question is, Sonia, is are, are, are young people going through this now? Yes, they are. And we know, particularly I know in my, from my friends in India and my time in India, there's a lot of pressure on young people yeah. to conform, to be what their parents want them to be, to be smart, to get in the best schools, yeah. pressure, pressure, pressure. So based upon what you learned from your story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? I think one thing that I would highly recommend every uh, you know young kid who's now looking to make career options or decisions that are very important for them whether it is choosing the stream of education or the university or career a lot of people will tell you a lot of things but recognize your strengths you know just first things first I think until and unless you know what really really you know, cheers you up. I think something that I tell people is that in the last six months to a year, just, you know, close your eyes and think about those times where you've felt that you're in absolute flow, mm. that you've loved doing what you do, that you did not even once think about why you were doing it. You were just so engrossed and involved in that activity. It could be art, it could be dance, it could be music, whatever gives you that kick you know first things first figure that out and uh, then see if there is you know there's a concept of ikigai right uh, you know if you're passionate about something and you really enjoy it you love it see if there is a possibility to transition that into a profession something that will also make you money that'll make you happy that'll create an impact in the world go all out for it you know stand up for what you really want to do but recognize first, take time in self-reflection and help yourself before you can help anybody else. But that's the thing that I have understood from my life and that I would love to pass on. Whatever gives you that kick. I like it. I like it. What is a resource of yours or any other resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? Um, I actually get into a lot of conversations, Andrew, with CXOs, especially women who are in the position of CXOs and high achieving entrepreneurs. And it's called CXO Talks, which is there on all podcast streaming platforms, as well as YouTube. Anybody who's aspiring to really go on the path uh, professionally of growth, of high achievement, whether as an entrepreneur um, an aspiring entrepreneur, or if you are in middle management looking to go and grow yourself into um, executive positions, this is one resource I will highly recommend. And these are the conversations where we don't talk the dry, uh, high and dry conversations about what makes you a CXO, but about candid, vulnerable stories which is about what really goes into making, uh, whether it is the grind, whether it is those uh, icky, murky moments or your regrets. I talk about all of those and that's something that I'd highly recommend to anybody who's looking to go that way and that path. And um, that's, I'm assuming, on every podcast platform that's out there. Yes, wherever you listen to yep. your podcast, okay. it's well, there. I'll have links to that in the show notes, ladies and gentlemen, so you can click on them and check it out. Okay, last question. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> for the next 12 months, uh, my number one goal is... Um, hmm. It's actually... Uh, you know, I've been focused, Andrew, of late on... Uh, on better health and fitness, because what I've realized is that while as a high achieving entrepreneur, somebody who wants to achieve a lot of things, grow and scale rapidly, uh, the last thing that we keep on our priority is our health. And uh, as cliche as the saying is, your health is your wealth. Uh, I now see how true that is, because in the last 
two years of COVID and post-COVID, the kind of health recovery and troubles that I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs going through. I feel that I don't want to be that space. You know, I really want to be active, healthy and be able to, you know, once I know that if I'm physically healthy, uh, to be able to ensure that I'm mentally healthy kind of goes hand in hand. So yeah, that's one thing that is my number one goal for the next 12 months. Good mm -hmm. health, good fitness, uh, and physically, mentally, spiritually, and uh, that'll help me grow and go wherever I want to. That's exciting. You know, I always, uh, I never really exercised in my life and I always kind of found it hard. And what I've found in my life is whatever I, it's hard, whatever's hard in my life, I do first thing in the morning. <laughs> oh, so yeah. I, when I was working on my dissertation many years ago for my PhD, first three hours of the day for seven months straight, when I've written books, when I've done other things, it's mm. like, I've got to grab that time. So I know what your, what your challenge, and I feel the same challenge is just to keep getting better exercise. And we have a park nearby here in Bangkok that I go to pretty much every morning. And then recently I've been um, stopping eating at lunch. So I eat my lunch mm -hmm. and then I don't eat any more food for the rest of the day. And that has been phenomenal for allowing me to have a deeper sleep and bring my heart rate down to a much lower level. So that's been something, you know, we all have our different things, but that's yeah. one I'm, I'm experimenting with and finding it pretty exciting. So hats off to you and we look forward to your continued health. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. If you haven't yet joined the Become a Better Investor community, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now and claim your spot. As we conclude, Sonia, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Actually, I think your audience, uh, I'm sure, is as grateful as I am because there's so much, such wealth of insights that come from some really worst investments. I don't think there's any any other way for you to get better at investing into yourself than to consume is better than to make your worst investments and then realize, ouch, this is not supposed to be done. It's better to learn from others' mistakes. So yeah, I think that's a phenomenal job you're doing, Andrew. Thank you. And we all appreciate that. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well. Fellow risk takers, let's celebrate that today we added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.